Welcome to Our Highest Work, a podcast where we are gathering and sharing the best ideas for spiritually based business and career success, and where we're growing a community of wise and loving mutual help. My name is George Cow, and I'm particularly excited about today's episode because I've got a special guest. Um, so Jessica Hagee is, and I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing your name right, Jessica. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> okay. So Jessica, I first heard of, I first found your work. I guess I'll, I'll address you now that uh, hopefully folks can see you here. And um, I first found your work uh, when I found this uh, post on Forbes. I somehow found a link. One of my clients, I think, I posted it on Facebook. It was 20 Ways to Find Your Calling. And I actually posted that article in the announcement of our podcast Facebook group. So for those of you who are, um, you know, didn't, didn't see that, you can just go to our, our, our Facebook thread for this episode. This is episode 18. Actually, today is April 18th, and this happens to be episode 18. Um, you can look at that thread for the link to um, the first article that I saw uh, Jessica uh, Jessica's doodles in. And I'll also, will of course, put any other links that... Um, Jessica wants to put on in that thread as well. So Jessica, and I'll, I should say that I loved your doodles, and uh, I thought they were really whimsical, but uh, but also interesting. And um, I thought you had some great, uh, great insight, advice to share about finding our calling. Uh, our podcast is basically covering a wide variety of topics of, of my passion. So we we talk about finding our calling. We also talk about we even talk about marketing, authentic marketing particularly. We talk about personal growth, spiritual growth. We also talk about what I call mindful activism. That's actually coming up in a couple of episodes. Um, and we talk about being a better leader. So we have folks who are uh, listening and watching to this who are either, you know, they're business owners or starting a business, they're growing a business, or they may be um, leaders within organizations. So. Anyway, we're, we're talking basically to kindred spirits who care about uh, growing ourselves and doing it in a way that's uh, generous and, and thoughtful. So anyway, welcome to you, Jessica. Well, thank you. That's, that's a lovely setup. Yeah. So what I would love to do is to actually, well, I want to give you a chance to talk about whatever you are most interested in talking about. I thought what might be cool to kind of... Um, uh, find some topics uh, that we can, we can talk about is some of the doodles that I picked up. I mean, you have, by this point, I think hundreds of, of, of doodles. Is that right? Uh, actually, today I posted, I think it was 4,000-something. <laughs> okay. It's well, my job at this point. They just keep coming. <laughs> That's really, really cool. How many years, by the way, have you been doing that? Gosh, I started in 2006, and for a while it was just a side project, and now it's what I do all the time. Wow, and you do doodles... Of course, you have blog posts. You have a Medium uh, pro account. You you doodle on Forbes. You do articles there. Some of your Forbes articles have been seen by. I saw um, a couple of them were over a million views. Is that right? Yeah, uh, people really sort of gravitate to this stuff, and I'm not sure why, but I'm glad. And I get to draw for clients all over the place in all sorts of formats. And it's the internet is great. You can find everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Well, bef without further ado, I just want to go in and actually let's even just take a look at um, you, one of the doodles that I picked up. Um, and uh, let's see here. I'm going to actually figure this. Some, this is something that I haven't done yet, which is a screen share while a guest is on. So I'm going to do my best with this. Okay. And, uh, let's see how this works here. So thanks, everyone, for your patience while I pull up the first doodle that I wanted to talk with um, Jessica about. So now, can you see this? Yeah. And I'm sorry that it's kind of weird that it's kind of just in the corner of the screen. Let me see if I can make this. There we go. That's better. Okay, and I'm going to collapse <coughs> bookmarks. So, so this is a, this is a fairly uh, simple doodle, but I know that there's a lot that both you and I can talk about it. But I just really love because I, I actually have my own little <laughs> not a doodle, but I have a diagram which I'll I'll, I'll send you later, Jessica, about about our calling, and it, it has to do with event circle as well. But I want you to talk about this. Um, Tell, tell us, and actually some, a lot of people who are listening to the podcast are just listening without watching, so maybe you can explain it a little bit visually so people can picture it and then talk about your, your insights around that. Sure. My doodles are pretty simple, simple format. So this is a Venn diagram with one loop of the Venn 
labeled as passion, the other one is cause, and the overlap is purpose. And this, I think, was from the How to Be Interesting article. And well, actually, I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, it might have been, or I might have found it in the 20 Ways to Find Your Calling. But anyway, okay. it's in one of your <laughs> articles. <laughs> and it's, uh, if you have a cause, you have motivation and reason and things to do what, what you do. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those things that just putting a few words in context of each other really sort of bring them all together. Mm. And that's one of the visual grammar things that I play with a lot. So the the passion and cause can both be subjects or objects in the transitional sentence, and the overlap of the Venn diagram serves as a conjunction. So whatever you have in the middle becomes your subjunctive sort of clause result. I'm mangling my grammar a little bit here. No, no, no. I totally, I totally, I, I love how you think about it in terms of grammar. I mean, yeah. I just look at it, and I just look at it, and I, I just try to basically grok it intuitively. But you're actually, um, when you when you come up with these doodles, and by the way, do you recommend other like, do you recommend most of us to doodle more? Like, what what are your thoughts on that? I think it's everyone has a different thought process, and everyone's sort of told to write notes in a particular way or take notes in a particular way, and doodling actually gets your ideas out more organically, so you can think through things visually. Mm -hmm. a lot faster and a lot more thoroughly than you could if you tried to say things out loud or jot down simple words or a list to yourself. Mm. It's a it's another way to sort of think through things. I, I like I don't that know a lot. Anybody who who doodles who doesn't who doesn't hold it close to their heart as sort of their don't you rip this away from me. It's the one thing that helps me clear my brain. <laughs> how and how do you recommend people start? Because I know that when we start any new skill, we're pretty bad at it, and I imagine you didn't start with uh, all these brilliant ideas. Maybe you did. No, not at all. I actually, I was taking uh, my MBA at night, and so much of MBA courses in finance and all sorts of things are chart-based, and charts were used to describe everything in the world, and so I actually started taking notes like this. So then I realized that if you can grammatically break down an idea into graph form, you can say anything about anything in graph form, and you can make jokes, and you can tell little stories, and you can pull ideas together that people wouldn't have thought to juxtapose. Yeah. So it just it became like sort of a little toy for me to play with, and at first I was, I was just really rough, and when I started the blog, I mean, I didn't think anybody would see it, so I was just throwing things up, and, but the more I did it, the more it became sort of like my little language that I had. Mm-hmm. So I can think of the punchline before I draw it up, and as long as you're the one telling the joke, you get to figure out how it fits. Mm. So I'm lucky that way that as long as I get to tell the joke, I can, I can format it this way. Totally. And so one of your uh, ways of doing it is is using Venn diagrams, and I think that makes a lot of sense because Venn diagrams is a good way to show that there is an integration between two major ideas. But let's let's talk a little bit about this purpose, passion, cause things because. Well, a lot of people who who ask about the purpose of life or t talk about their passion, they they basically usually just say that passion and purpose are the same thing. I, I love how you brought in the idea of cause to it. So, can you say about the, sort of the difference between passion and cause, and then how purpose fits in there? You know, you can have a passion for things like chocolate and naps. And <laughs> True. Um, Which I do. <laughs> thanks, Sudoku. And you can have a like really love affair with anything, but until it becomes external and until it becomes well bigger than you and monumental in scale, it's not really a purpose. I mean, if your purpose in life is shopping for shoes or licking Dorito crud off your fingers, you're not really you're not really serving a purpose yet. You're just you're a hedonist. You're not quite a, a doer yet. Ah. So the cause is actually where the external world comes into play. I think so, and I think then then you can manifest that loving, that like enthusiasm that you have in a way that other people can experience and benefit from. Yeah. Okay. So that's where the that's that's where true purpose is. Is what you're saying is that it's both something you really really enjoy that you could spend hours and hours doing because you love doing, and the fact that it's actually affecting the world in a way that inspires you, and that's where the purpose is. Yeah, I think, I mean, you can totally take the word purpose and molest it and strip it apart and think about it in a thousand different ways. Mm -hmm. But again, trying to simplify it into, okay, if your purpose is to do X, Y, and Z, it has to, it has to break down and be 
something else. So whenever you've got an actual purpose, if you don't care about it, it's not going to be your, it's not going to feel right to you. And if right. you're not doing it for anything else, you're not, it's not going to manifest anywhere. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Wow. And, and we're going to talk later about, uh, I want to ask you later about how you really got your work out there in the world because so many people, so many of us are trying to get our work into the world and, uh, you know, we're having a hard time doing it or, or, you know, we think, gosh, it's not happening fast enough. But um, before we go there, I actually want to um, just do a quick shout out. Uh, there are a couple of live viewers who are actually commenting away and uh, I can actually quickly show the screen here. Um, there's uh, uh, Kent and Keith and Becky so far are commenting. I really appreciate, uh, I always appreciate the live commenters because it makes me feel like I'm not just talking to myself anymore, I'm actually making, there's actually a cause here. <laughs> so hey. thank you Kent and Keith and uh, Becky for your comments and Keith says, what are doodles? And then he says, oh okay, little drawings. So yeah. Um, what, what would you say, uh, Jessica, are, are doodles? How would you define them? Uh, I think doodles are any any way that you pick up a pen or a pencil and make a mark that helps you think about things. Um, I like that. I, my blog started with me drawing on 3x5 index cards. So all of my, my work is very small mm -hmm. and very portable, and that makes me have to sort of use the constraints of size as much as anything else to get the words really, really terse and quick. So if I had a bigger piece of paper, I would be tempted to put more things on it. And as it is with a 3x5 index card, you can only fit so many words on it before it just becomes a messy piece of imagery. Got it. Yes, I, I love that. And um, and by the way, I, I before I go on to the next doodle, I, I want to invite everyone who is uh, watching live to please feel free to um, post comments and questions for, for for Jessica while we have her here. And uh, you know, you can ask Jessica about anything that's related to these doodles. You can ask her about how she got her blog to be so popular. Um, et cetera, et cetera, how she got her work out there, which I guess I'll, I'll be asking that too. But, but Jessica, let's, let's go on to this um, doodle here, value popularity. Maybe you can talk us through it a little bit and then uh, tell us what you, what you mean by it. I think, um, I think so much of stuff that is popular now or shared a lot or seen a lot or consumed a lot isn't necessarily as valuable as we think it is. Mm. A lot of those listicles and things, and I'm guilty of this too, because I mean, I numbered some some articles I did just to get the number in the headline, which tends to get traction online. And popularity of those of like seventeen thousand cats that will impress you with their dexterity, and you're like, oh, okay. And you look at that, and it, then you leave it, and three days later, that was ten minutes of your life you'll never get back, and that feels like that empty popularity. But then sometimes things that are difficult and hard to talk about won't be really popular. Um, people talking about things that are depressing or difficult or tedious or very, very academic tend to be over in that high value, low popularity category. Mm. But it's the things that are both popular and valuable that just feel automatic. And when you think about them, you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Everybody wants, wants that. Everybody wants a little bit of kindness and compassion and something that they can get their arms around. So the obviousness of things that are high value and high popularity is something that I struggle to come up with when I'm drawing. Mm, I love that. And I, I, I love this very simple uh, doodle, but it says a lot. And I, I love how thinking, I, I love to think about what are the examples in my own work and in my own life and my own interests, um, the things I tend to post. Where do they fit in? Are they high value, low popularity? Which is actually really hard, right? Because we maybe you could talk about it a little bit. Some of the things that I post, I think, are really, really high value, but they're not liked, uh, commented on as as much as some things are. Way I'm like some things surprise me how much they're liked and commented on. Some things I think are really important, but aren't liked as much by my audience. So talk about that. I mean, I'm sure in your work you've, you've experienced that too. Oh, yeah, and because, I mean, the Internet does consume things so quickly, you can test your sort of depth of scale and content and weights on things and see what sticks and what doesn't. And, again, bringing it back to food, if you think about, like, 
a cheese puff that's entirely empty, but everyone loves them. And then to the right, you've got like your spinach that you know you should eat, and it'll be good for you in a thousand ways, and yet it's hard to grab it out of the fridge and eat it. Yeah. So that that rightness can sometimes feel really sort of authoritative or preachy or heavy. Oh. That you want to you want you have to get it across in a way that makes it delicious and snuggly and something people like to share. So that's where I try and put humor into things. Oh. And I think really dark humor sometimes is a really good way to bring attention to something that is a little bit creepy if it weren't funny. Right. I, I love what you just said. So what you're saying is that it's actually sometimes very easy for us to post, to share what is right, what is high value in our minds, and we find that it's not popular until we're able to say it in a way that is more easily digestible. Um, you, you, you said snugly and things like delicious, right? But things that um, are appetizing, in other words. Yeah, a, a sort of if you have a comfort food that goes down easy as far as content goes. And you asked about content before where you said everybody's trying to get things out there and get traction. And so much change has happened since I started blogging. Because I started in 2006 when it was a sort of blogosphere and it was sharing and reposting and there were so many more people with their own little pieces of real estate on the internet and it wasn't all about streams and it wasn't all about what's in your feed and what's coming through and sharing and liking. Mm -hmm. It was still all about, I saw this, I want to comment on it, I'll repost it to my place. It was about curation a little bit more than just consumption. So any more really finding, finding your way into feeds is one of the, the main drivers of popularity online, which was sort of a tangent there. But. No, I, I, I like what you're saying. So how, do, how, how, how did you get yourself into feeds? Uh, well, I had the traction that I built up in around 2006, 2008, when my little corner of the web, which started as a blog spot, one of those free, crazy, really basic-looking things, and it got traction from... Uh, it was posted to Metafilter about a week after I started it. And then Google grabbed it as blog of the day, and it just went from there. And I didn't really know who was behind those links or how they started, and it, it was really hard to track. And remember, do you remember Technorati? Yes. So I used to have to sort of like search for myself on Technorati to see who was posting my stuff where, and that was really useful, and that, nothing like that exists anymore because you can't search Facebook and you can't search... Well, you can search Twitter, but it's a lot more difficult because yeah. the URL shorteners change and your content yeah. gets grabbed and reposted and relabeled, and <clears throat> you really just have to sort of stalk yourself to find out where your traffic's coming from. Yeah, actually, there is a tool that I'm using. The free version is quite limited to just one brand, uh, one thing, one keyword, I guess you could track, or one, I guess, one profile. It's called Mention. Dot net. Have you heard of that one? No, but it sounds like something I need to start looking into. Because yeah, oh, um, you, you would, it would make it so much easier for you, and I'm just kind of showing you real quick and showing everyone here. Check this out. It's, it's basically free, and it works so much better than Google Alerts. I'm getting, I, I'm now able to see on a daily basis. It's like a scratch the surface sort of thing. Yeah, like I'm, I'm able to see on a daily basis who is posting about me in Facebook and Twitter and blogs and everywhere. It just comes as a, as a summary. And, oh, wow. um, yeah, that, and might, that might be maddening, though, because you never, I mean, just knowing yeah. enough to be dangerous is one thing, but <laughs> it's everything. I don't know if I want to... No, you're, you're right. Yeah, I mean, for, <laughs> for brands like, like me, they're just getting, you know, if I'm lucky, you know, a couple of mentions a week. I, I like it a lot, <laughs> but, but the other thing, that this website, it actually allows you to mark... Um, I, well, I'm not sure I want to log in right now on it, but it allows you to mark which sources are irrelevant. So, like, I, you know, in the beginning, I had to mark a bunch of, you know, Russian, um, <laughs> Russian spam sites as irrelevant and that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, fun. But, yeah, I mean, after that, it, it tends to get pretty good results. Anyway, so I, um, I, I, I love how, so in the beginning, you really just started doodling, and then someone found your content and thought it was great, right? 
Yeah, it was a little frightening, honestly. I I posted some stuff, and I thought, okay, there, I can check that off my resume. Like, I'm a writer, and I've got a blog, yay. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting emails from people all over the place. And wow. my agent, who is still my fairy godfather of all things publishing, emails me and said, do you think you could make a book out of this? I'm like, this is completely backwards, and this is really cool, and wow. how did this happen? And I still don't really know. And Yeah, I, I, I hear that so much, actually, from people who are able to get their stuff out there in a big way. Like, they just, it, sometimes it makes me feel like it's kind of karmic, like it's just kind of meant to be. But I also think, but, you know, you, you actually have now written a book, a whole book called, you know, How to Be Interesting. So let's actually take a quick look at, at, at the traits that you've written down as, um, as how to be interesting. Because I think that if we were more uh, wise about doing the things that you've listed here, um, we would be more likely to be picked up, right? I think, yeah, there's a lot of mimicry online, a lot of copycatting and a lot of coattail riding and a lot of cut-paste recolor. And it's it's sad because if people put just a, as much energy into creating their own stuff as they did to stealing other people's stuff, there would be so much more fun, thing, just fun everything out there. Mm. Okay, so... Um, for those who aren't able to see the screen right now, and by the way, those of you who do want to see the screen, I'm, you, know, you can check out the video and the comments at ourhighestwork.com slash 18. This is episode 18. So ourhighestwork.com slash 18, and you'll be able to see the stuff that we're showing on the screen here. So here on this list, and I'm just going to run through them real quick, and then uh, would love to get your take on some of them. And actually, I, I do want to check out what the... Uh, what the comments that are coming through are, if there are any questions, etc. Um, okay, the, uh, the the words on how to be int- you know, you have an equation here. You've got all these words, and you've got a plus sign, and then equals interesting. So you've got generous, active, strange, and <laughs> now that's one that doesn't want to help. Caring, humble, daring, original, brave, self-assured. Now, and equals interesting. Now, I know that these words aren't necessarily meant to be every single word is its own separate domain, but um, let, me, let me actually allow you to first speak to what you would like to speak to here about this. Uh, yeah, this is actually a visual summary of the book, How to Be Interesting. Oh, cool. So cool. It comes from, let me grab, I have my sneaky cliff notes to myself over here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the ten steps in order are go exploring, share what you discover, do something, anything, embrace your weirdness, have a cause, there's that image that you would pulled up before, uh, minimize the swagger, give it a shot, hop off the bandwagon, grow a pair, and ignore the scolds. So getting into these words is sort of go out there and put your stuff out there and share it and actually make things that you can care about. and. Don't mimic other people or try and sound like other people sound. And mm-hmm. if you care about things, then people will care about you. It's a really sort of reciprocal equation. Uh, the humility is important because you find that a lot of people who just do straight up self-promotion as opposed to sharing things mm. tend to not get as much as much attention, love. Like People don't read that. Yeah. Uh, to be daring is to just sort of say, you know what, I like this, or... This matters to me, and I'm putting it out there. Original, again, is just thinking, you know what? Other people are doing X, Y, Z. I should do A, B, C. And there's bravery associated with that. So you really have to just go with your own gut and stop listening to everybody who says, no, you'll never do that. That's pointless. That's silly. That's stupid. Get away from that. And the self-assurance comes from doing all of that stuff just enough times to get a little positive reinforcement. So the more you go out there, and the more you explore, and the more you share, and the more you investigate, the more fun it is, and the more reward you'll see. And it's a really sort of self-perpetuating cycle of interestingness, I suppose I could say. I should draw that. Yeah, I, I, I would like to see it. I'll, I'll post it. Send it to me when you do, and I'll, I'll post it to our group, too. So, so okay. The hardest part of being interesting is that in the beginning, well, there's actually, I think I can, I can think of um, sort of two really difficult parts about being interesting. One is, as you've already said, 
um, people will um, you know tell you what the formula is uh, you know if you want to be successful you have to do this this and this or you have to act in this way and, and it's actually the, quite a com the common phrase right fake it till you make it mm -hmm. it is the opposite of being original right well but, I think part of that is just faking that confidence mm, okay all right I, I like I, that I always thought of the uh, you just have to act a little bit bigger than you are like you're not a, a junior intern. You're actually a functional member of the team. You're actually you're big enough to matter, and that's how I always saw "fake it till you make it." Oh, okay. So you're really talking talking about um, living into what you your potential actually is. Yeah. If you sort of know deep down that you are meant for bigger and greater things, if you start just acting like, yeah, I'm doing these awesome things, and then start doing them, they will happen. And as opposed to sort of asking the universe for permission to be as awesome as you think you can be. Okay, that's really that's really great. And then the other thing, the other hard part in my mind about um, being interesting is that, um, and in fact, this harkens to what we just said earlier about the value popularity. Is that when we're doing something that we think has high value and it isn't being popular, uh, we 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 you know. Some of us uh, create a, a product or a service, and we offer it, and people aren't taking us up on that. Or we put our heart into a particular blog post or a podcast episode, and we think it's really important, but it's not one of our popular ones. But few few people if any say anything about that. Talk about that. I mean, you must have experienced that a lot in your four thousand doodles, right? Oh yeah. Well, sometimes I throw something online and. It goes everywhere, and I'm really not sure why. And other times, there's something that I'm really like, I've got to a good nugget of information here, and I put it up there, and it's just crickets. Mm. So you have to sort of trust your own curator, I guess, a little bit, to be like, if you believe in it, if somebody else will, like at least one other person will. And if they connect on it on a really deep level, that's almost more valuable than 20 people who just liked it on Facebook because they snickered a little bit. Ah. Uh. Okay, and, and you get yeah. to decide on your on your own terms what is a worthwhile interaction and what is what is enough of an audience. I mean, sometimes if you write a mo the most beautiful love poem in the history of the world and only one person reads it, that's a very successful love letter. You don't have to have to have an audience of tens of thousands to really to really make your work worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, I I like that a lot, and that's actually something that I have been speaking to my audience about is that so many um, marketing experts say, you know, suggest or teach that we need to have a huge audience and that's sort of always the assumed thing like well of course everyone wants a big audience, huge audience and I, I say to people listen you, you really just need to have maybe a hundred fans uh, if even that, even fifty fans and if you truly are useful um, to those fifty people uh, you can you can create a service, a product uh, that is truly useful to them, that may be enough, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how many audience members I have every month, but not all of them are my clients. And I may only have 10 to 15 clients at a time, but I've got a million readers. And it's there's a scale for everybody that that equation is different. So it might be one over a million, or it might be one over 10. And there are so many different business models out there, and there are so many different different audiences and different kinds of content that 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 percentage is really different than it's different for everybody mm, yeah yeah that's great um, I, I wanna bring bring up a comment um, from Kent uh, in the in the chat room he, he wrote uh, and actually I'll, I'll, I'll put this up on the screen uh, if I can being vulnerable greater than being popular. <laughs> yeah, you have to take a risk if you're going to put put real things out there and it's the real things that ironically tend to resonate with people. Have you uh, read Hyperbole and a Half? No, I haven't. She's a cartoonist and she's very vulnerable with a lot of things and she did a really great comic about depression that millions and millions of people resonated with and responded to and appreciated because it was so very vulnerable and so very real and that sort of realness is I mean in marketing blogs are you gonna get are you gonna get people to say 
this is the truth about what I feel right now. I mean, topics-wise, too, you have to really know, like, who you're talking to and why and what you should be vulnerable about. And that's there are so many different different voices out there. There are so many different flavors of that. Yeah. No, that's really great. I, I'm just realizing, my gosh, time has already flew, and I'm actually okay with time, but I, I want to respect your time. Do you do you need to get going? Uh, I'm good. Okay, it's good for a little bit. Well, let, let's talk about a few more of these doodles, and then we'll talk about where folks can connect with you. Um, this one was uh, interesting, and I, I would love for you to <laughs> talk about this a little bit here. <laughs> this is, yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is an illustration from, so I took Sun Tzu's Art of War, Mm -hmm. And it's written in verse form, a lot like the Bible. And I took every verse and diagrammed it. And that is actually my next book that's going to be coming out in March, is an, The Illustrated Art of War. So wow. this is, I think, from one of the first chapters. And he's talking about how your army needs, needs methodology and needs to be organized and needs to respect. You need to respect them and they need to respect you. And just thinking about, like, what is professionalism and what is good behavior and what is the absolute opposite of that in a way that's kind of kind of weird and sort of mentally jarring to think about like in an office setting all of a sudden if you have a, a feral child in a loincloth like crawling through the copier like <laughs> oh that's just just like a juxtaposition in your head of I'm, I went from war and armies and professionalism and now I'm in the office and then the idea of feral children just sort of bringing that all home is a yeah yeah, and the, but the funny thing, of course, is that um, professionalism, obviously, we, we need it most of the time. Sometimes it's the feral children who actually have the brightest ideas <laughs> occasionally, right? Oh, yeah. Well, if, you, if you're too boxed in and your job description is very narrow or your role is very small, breaking outside of that even a tiny bit, even in a very professional way, but that's just not your role, is seen as extremely weird and odd and... What is acceptable and what isn't acceptable is totally dependent on culture. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's there's a lot. Um, there's a couple more doodles that I I, uh, I thought were um, particularly interesting. This one, caring just enough. You've got this um, y and x axis. The y axis is fun. So higher 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 fun, lower fun. You've got the the x axis, which is motivation, lower motivation, higher motivation. You've got this curve. On on low fun, low motivation, you've got yawn. Got high fun, uh, middle motivation, caring just enough, and then high motivation, low fun is burnout. Yeah, so, I, think, I think that parabola carries carries through for motivation because so many people need to care about something and need to do it, but when it becomes all consuming and you can't do anything else and you're driven to isolation and zealotry, then then it just becomes a handicap as opposed to an asset. Mm, I like that. And I, I like that you, <laughs> you mentioned isolation and zealotry. That's interesting. I think a lot of folks who, well, a lot of folks who are listening to this podcast are sort of business owners and as business owners and, you know, leaders tend to be, um, I think, too isolated. Uh, not uh, Sometimes not collaborative enough or thinking that they can't reach out or afraid of reaching out. Um, talk about that a little bit, because uh, as an as an artist, uh, as an author, uh, you are uh, doing a lot of work in isolation. How do you stay connected enough to um, avoid burnout? Uh, one, I have a dog who I get to talk to during the day, which sounds really bizarre. No, it's I, I get it. But yeah, sometimes you just look over and you're like, "Hey, does this make sense?" And she's really <laughs> not analyzing the word document I have in front of, in front of me, but she is giving me. Feedback, as in, I'm here and I'm, I'm somehow helping your environment. And I talk to her a lot. I have dozens of crazy weirdos on the internet that I can call up at any time. I try and get out of the house as much as possible. And really, working from home is both a benefit and a curse sometimes because you can really sort of nerd out and zone out and get a lot of things done in a very short time because people aren't pinging at you. Mm -hmm. And yet, on the other side it is the blank document every day that you stare at and there's no one even around the corner saying, you owe me this today, get this done. Mm. So it's it's a fine line and coffee always helps. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, uh, there is just one more uh, that I want to bring up and it is, 
It's the known path to success. And uh, in fact, I probably should have brought this up earlier, but we were talking about this a bit a little earlier. But um, tell us, tell us about this. So we, we've got this, we've got this beautiful chart. We've got this um, simple and beautiful chart of this uh, infinity symbol, but it's really a it arrows um, that tap into the an, an arrow of a path that taps into follow the rules at some times and then improvise at some times. So tell us about that and sort of your 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 experience with that. Uh, there was someone talking about leadership a long time ago. I think this was still in, when I was in college. I remember this was the leaders know what rules to break, and the people just starting out know all the rules, but they don't know which to break. And knowing what is expected and what is mandatory and what is kind of a suggestion of a rule is a really powerful piece of information and a way of knowing. Yeah. And that, that's only brought through experience. So the more you do, the more you'll know what's, what's absolutely mandatory and what is absolutely not and what's been done and what hasn't. And just sort of keep, keep pushing on that and not just expecting that what you're told is true. Mm. Got it. Yeah, no, this, this is great. I love it. Well, um, let's end the episode with uh, how folks can connect with you. Um, what are you working on? Uh, yeah, tell us more. Uh, right now I am furiously putting together my Art of War book, which is coming along really neatly, and I'm having a lot of fun with that. I write over for Medium. I am on Twitter at my full name, at Jessica Hagee on Twitter, and I'm still blogging at that original Blogspot site that I've ported over to thisisindex.com. So every single day as a creative mandatory habit, I post another copy. Oh, that's that's awesome. And um, can folks sign up for some for some email list or something to get notified about your book? Or how how should they follow you on that Twitter? Or what would you recommend? Uh, Twitter is the best way. You'll get the most up to date everything. And so much with email. I even have a Mailchimp newsletter that I send out. But so many things end up in spam, and you really can't trust it. So Twitter is public, always available, and it's always the most up to date. Awesome. Well, I will be sure to post uh, the links. Again, it's at Jessica, H-A-G-Y, at Twitter, or that's at, you know, and on, on Twitter. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I hope this was fun for you. I know it was fun for me and for the watchers and listeners, and uh, just want to thank you for doing you doing your creative work in the world that um, inspires us to um, be brave about being original. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm lucky I get to do this. Yeah, awesome, awesome. All right, everyone, so until the next episode, keep your thoughts positive. This is George Cow and Jessica Hakey signing off. Thanks. Thank you.